Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Psalms, chapter number 33. Psalms, chapter number 33. We'll begin reading at verse number 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. Verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The people He has chosen as His own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of His dwelling, He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope for safety. A nuclear arsenal, wait, it doesn't say that, but that's probably what it would translate today, huh? Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His mercy. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading and the ministry of His Word. Amen. I want you to imagine with me, If this week you turned on CNN, Fox News, and you heard these three announcements. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has just issued this statement. God has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians as our leaders. Or secondly... Inquiries by reporters have shown that almost every state legislature has now passed a law that all elected officials have to take an oath professing faith to God the Father and in Jesus Christ His Son and to acknowledge that the Holy Scriptures are given by inspiration of God. Or thirdly, if you saw on the news, that Congress approved and recommended and funded the use of Bibles in every school because what is better to teach morality than the Old and the New Testaments? If you saw those things on the news, you would think you were dreaming. But in reality, you can see in the pages of our history that all three of these happened. Today, if that were to happen, they would talk about the right-wing kooks that are, who is it on the Supreme Court that's such a right-wing fanatic, a religious nutcase, that would be even saying such things? Who is it in Congress that is a bigoted, hate-filled, hate-monger that's recommending that we put Bibles in the schools? How we have drifted. And almost so much so that there's been so much propaganda and so much talk and talk about separation of church and state and and, and the president even talks about our values and I don't even know what book he's getting values from when he talks about our values because I don't recognize them as my values and maybe they're his values but when you said our values a hundred years ago in the U.S. it was clear that you were referring to the Christianity and the God of Scripture. As we look, as we celebrate tomorrow, 240 years since the Declaration of Independence, I wonder if those founding fathers would recognize the institutions that we, and, 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 and if we would even, 
if it looks anything like the America that they fought and bled and died and sacrificed for. Well, usually I like to take and look through the pages of Scripture and dive into a text and look at what a text means. I think that there's so much propaganda and it is not only filled the news and the media and reporters and newspapers and the internet and schools. I think that people have almost as a culture been brainwashed to forget that what we had in our founding was the God of the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ. We have roots in Christianity. America was settled by people that were looking for religious freedom. Our earliest settlers came here looking for freedom to worship God. Their motivation to come was not for gold. America was not born for greed. But they came to, to have a place where they could worship God. The souls that came across on the Mayflower, they were under tyranny and oppression. And the compact that they signed as they were coming across the ocean said that we are coming to the new world for the glory of God and the advancement of our Christian faith. Hmm. Those early colonies, the first thing that they built when they came together was a church so that they could worship God. Together. A place of worship to Almighty God. And they came to God during times of sorrow to pray and to repent. During times of blessing to give thanks and honor and worship to God. In 1643, more and more people arrived on these shores. Many of them coming for the very same reasons. The first document that was a a constitution, it was called the New England Confederation. And it began with these words. Whereas we all came into these parts with one and the same purpose, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberty of the gospel in purity and in peace. Wow. These were the spiritual forefathers that came and that began the colonies that would grow into the American countries. They had a strong desire to be pleasing to God. But... During the 150 years that passed from the time of the first pilgrims, the king of England began to say, you know what, that new world, that's a great place for me to empty all the prisons. So instead of sending you to prison, you have the option to go and serve as an indentured servant in the new world. And America that The colonies that began as Christian, seeking to worship God, seeking the liberty of the Lord, began to have the undesirables sent. It was the rough, it was the renegade, it was empty. Can you imagine? You you decide you're going to settle this new country and we're going to empty out all the prisons and we're going to ship all of them over there. That's what happened. An America that had begun as almost all Christians by 1730 was only 10% Christian because they had shipped so many rough and ready and renegades and uh, rebel rousers and fighters and troublemakers that sent so many over that there was only 10% that were Christians. The country that began for the glory of God, the advancement of the Christian faith had almost disappeared. By that time, There was so much. So this is the the time that if you're listening to people that want to rewrite history and talk about all the troubles of of, of the early Christians, well, they want to point to stuff that happened during this time, like the Salem witch trials when there were voodoo prisoners that were sent over that were doing different kinds of dark magic and all of the witch hunt that went on and the persecution that went on associated with it. But something happened... Right around 1730, there began to be some preachers of the gospel. Jonathan Edwards, you may have heard of one of his great messages, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He's the founder of Princeton University. 
Probably one of the brightest men that have ever lived in this country. He preached the gospel and preached about the wrath of God until it said that people stood with their hand gripping the pew in front of them until their knuckles turned white for fear of the pending judgment of God. He preached that man. You can still read that message. The, the, the history tells us that he wasn't that great of a speaker. He didn't have real good vision. He had to hold his manuscript right up to his face and he read it in monotone but somehow the truth and the power of the word of God that he and others like him Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield and John Wesley they began to preach they began to preach in church houses and the churches wouldn't hold them and then they began to preach in streets and in fields and soon there were meetings that were happening all over this country that had once been Christian but had fallen to 10% and within 10 years the country went from 10 10% devout Christians to over 50% that were devout servants of God. And this movement is now called the Great Awakening because God sent a revival and a stirring. I see somehow that God finds a way when it is the worst of times, when it is a clash of the coldest, deadest, darkest of night, that it is then that God sends a stirring of His Spirit. And I just wonder with all of the hell that is breaking loose around the world and even in our own country if we don't stand but on the brink of the great awakening happening again that God is about to maybe turn the tide and what is a backslidden nation is about to get struck with the spiritual power of heaven so that the church house can't contain them and you gotta have meetings out in fields and out under tents and out in the middle of nowhere because the spirit of God is moving again the Great Awakening. It was of the Great during that time of the Great Awakening. Benjamin Franklin wrote, "It was wonderful to see the change that was made in the manners of the people, from thoughtless or indifferent about religion. It was as if all the world were growing religious, so that no one could walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung." In different families on every street. It happened. Over 50% of the population were devout Christians. And it was this great awakening that led to the American Revolution. The Great Awakening was the precursor to the revolution. Our founding fathers that signed the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, those who put their lives on the line, who fought and died that we might be free, all these grew up in the time of revival of the Great Awakening. The leaders of the American Revolution were touched by the Great Awakening. Listen to this. The President of the United States wrote this in his diary. Let my heart, gracious God, be so affected by your glory and majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties that you require of me. Again, I have called on you for pardon and forgiveness of sins for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for me. You gave your Son to die for me. And you have given me assurance of salvation. Those were the words penned by the first American president when he took office. Can you imagine today a candidate even saying something like that publicly? It would be derided and ridiculed. There was a study from the University of Houston. They went and they looked through all of, the, all of the folks that framed the Constitution, that signed the Declaration of Independence, and looked for every writing, every public statement of, of them because they wanted to see uh, what, what was it that influenced these founding fathers in the way they thought as they created this new world and new government. They found over 15,000 writings. 15,000 from the founding fathers. Listen to this. 94% of those 15,000 documents from our founding fathers 
were quotes from the King James Bible. 94% of what they said was from the Bible. It's hard to imagine these days having the leadership of our country sound so religious, pious. It would be ridiculed. I mean, you get, you get somebody that just professes that they're a Christian or let alone them find out they got a tongue talker in their family and they're, they're posting all this stuff on, on, on live, just ridiculing and mocking and, 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 and people, people are afraid of it, but that's who we were. Godly men. America was founded by men and women who acknowledged God's supreme rule over men. And over creation. Listen to these words from the document that was signed 240 years ago tomorrow. We hold these truths to be self evident that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their powers from the consent of the governed. The framers of the Constitution, it said that after they wrote these words, and the Declaration of Independence ended with this, and for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of God, We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, our sacred honor. And then they gathered together and got on their knees and prayed. Wow. What would we think if we saw on the news Congress House of Representatives, Senate, Supreme Court, President, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, Barack Obama, Chief Justice Roberts, on their knees in front of the cross, praying. And while now it seems impossible, this is how we began. There are many that look at history and look at what happened. They, they believe that, that, that not only were our founding fathers committed to God, but we were protected and directed by God from the very start. Think about it. The British Empire of the time had the most powerful fighting force on the face of the earth. They were the wealthiest They were the best trained and a ragtag assembly of volunteers, farmers, tradesmen of the Continental Army faced them. They were outmanned, outgunned, outtrained, outfinanced. And only a miracle could have made them successful. But really... If you look at what happened, there's examples of those miracles. 25 days after the Declaration of Independence was signed, Washington had an army of 8,000, and he found himself trapped at the water's edge of the East River near Brooklyn, New York. 20,000 British soldiers were ready to attack. For some reason, they delayed their attack a bit. Maybe they were waiting on some others to come in and close the trap and wipe out the army when it first began. A rain came. A fog followed. And the fog set in so that there was only about six feet of visibility in front of you. Is all you could see. During that fog, Washington began on small boats to get the members of the Continental Army out. 
They moved them out a few at a time. And as the fog lifted, the last of the Continental Army was on a boat just out of firing range from the British. Some folks look at that and wonder, was it a coincidence? Or maybe this group that had birthed, been birthed in the Great Awakening believed God and prayed and, and, and stood on faith in God. And God helped them. Is it not, not just at the beginning of the, the war, you can go through and over and over, look at some of the writings and the diaries of Washington and see that there were many things that looked like maybe miracles. Maybe none greater than at the end of the war. The war was almost near end, and all that had to happen was the Continental Army had to join with the French and trap the British General Cornwallis in Virginia. Washington's army was in New York. The French were coming across the Atlantic. And they had to meet up in the same spot so that together they could ambush the British. Now today that wouldn't be that difficult. You know, you could get on Skype or FaceTime and say, where are you at? Where do you want to meet at? You could use a GPS. Don't do it on Beehive, but, you know, there could have been different places they might have been able to, to get together. But without telegram, telephone, anything, they happened to meet up at the same spot and coordinated the last great attack that wiped out the British. There were miracles. Not just that. Uh, I, I, our, 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 our leaders saw a sense of honoring God. And even the way our government is formed, they look to Scripture for guidance. Isaiah 33 says, God is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. And they use that to form the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and the executive branch of government. They, when they built the Washington Monument, it is by law the tallest building allowed to be in Washington, D.C., and at the very top of that monument, the words are inscribed, Let God be praised. Wow. How unusual for the way things are today. In 1892, the Supreme Court said this, our laws and our institutions must necessarily be based on and include the teachings of the Redeemer of mankind. It is impossible for it to be otherwise. To this extent, our civilization and our institutions are emphatically Christian. When I see the words of Psalms 33, and it says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So long we have been blessed as a people because we have honored God. Because we have looked to His Word. Because we have exalted higher than any of our governments in Washington. The praise and glory of God to put on the Washington Monument. Let God be praised. But now I, I, I think we stand at a time. Where many are trying to reinvent America. They're trying to redefine who we are. They want to scrub from our history. Every aspect of Christianity. They want to start a new value system. And I don't understand what those are. But I thank God that the Scripture says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, God told Solomon, you can go away, you can fall away, you can be judged, you can be carried off, 
But if after all of that happens, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. God help us. I think like it was in the Great Awakening. It might look like what we started has turned into a mess. That what we began as a movement of the Spirit has been so corrupted that there is no hope. But I believe that just like in the Great Awakening 150 years after they started a good work, it had become a terrible mess. That if God's people will return to the Lord our God in prayer. You see, the tragedy is not that they've taken prayer out of schools, is that we've let it leave on our own out of the church. The tragedy is not that they took the commandments off the walls of the courthouses, it's that we took them off of the walls of our own hearts. The tragedy is not all of the sin that's in the world, it's that it's already filled up the church. But if my people, which are called by my name, will humble ourselves, and pray there is still hope and it is when the church of the living God turns back to God when we repent and we turn our hearts to the Lord Hallelujah! I think in so many ways Lot after he had been rescued from Sodom God had saved him from judgment He said, is it okay if I don't go into the mountains? If I stay in these plains? And I think maybe that we in the church, we don't want to live in the sin of Sodom. But we want to stand close. And almost be there. We don't want to be hooked on alcohol. But more and more I'm seeing Christians that want to socially drink. I heard Jesse Duplantis talk about this. He said, if you want to be a drunk, just be a drunk. Quit being half-hearted about it. We don't want to live in adultery. But we'll look at inappropriate things on the phone or on the internet. We don't want to be entangled, but we want to live about as close to it as we can. Living in Babylon. Living in a secular world. Living in a pagan culture. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego learns that even if you're in the middle of Babylon, that you can still live devoutly to God. That you can still only worship the true God. That we don't have to bow our knee. That we don't have to compromise and consume what everybody else consumes. That we don't have to be corrupted by the influences of this world. But that we as as the people of God can be in the middle of a pagan and sinful culture and still keep our holy honor unto God Almighty. You know, in these revivals, they preached with great power and great conviction about holiness, about living clean. And I think... As we've looked at maybe some of the things that they talked about that were legalistic. That we've thrown out the baby with the bathwater. 
that we've been so afraid of becoming legalistic because of the you know trying trying to legislate how long this has got to be or or how you got to exactly do this or that and we, we've strayed so far from legalism that we have forgot that there is power in a holiness there is power in commitment there is power in devotion there is power in sacrifice and having a life before God that says God I want to live fully devoted to you my people are called by my name 240 years ago that began a good work and I wonder if we're going to let what has been passed on to us die on our watch if we're going to let the freedoms if we're going to let during our time the spiritual the revival the church if we're going to let in this community what we have inherited from people that sacrificed that bled that gave that sweat that prayed, that cried, and that did all that they did in faith and honor to God. If we're going to sleep and let it die on our watch. Evil can only prevail when good men do nothing. The enemy can only prevail if we sit aside and think there's nothing I can do what could happen if we as the church really repented and sought God we wouldn't have to fight gay marriage in the courts we'd get the homosexuals saved and delivered and we wouldn't have to worry about it We'd have to fight abortion in the courts. We'd get people saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and touched by God and their life redeemed. We wouldn't have to worry about it. If we would allow the power of God to flow through us, then what God did before, He'll do again. And so as we celebrate and remember and let off fireworks, somebody said to my what blew up on it, one in their hand and blew their hands off. Man, we know how to celebrate, don't we? Because we celebrate. We eat our potato salad and watermelon. Throw some food on the grill. My Kenyan friend, he was with me on Memorial Day. First time that he spent a long period in the U.S., with me on Memorial Day and he actually stayed through the 4th of July on Memorial Day we cooked out and we had potato salad and watermelon and we had all this food and then 4th of July we pretty much did the exact same thing he said do y'all celebrate everything the same way by eating and (laughs) yeah pretty much you mark the holiday by what kind of food do you eat well we have ham on this one and we got turkey on this one and we barbecue on this one different kind of food I want to challenge you to do two things. With your family, with your friends. Go find on the internet, print out a copy of the Declaration of Independence. And read it. And see, if you can't see that there was a faith, a belief in God, a conviction that moved our founding fathers. They weren't perfect but move them to begin a good work. And then I want us to all find a time to pray and repent to God that we've allowed the sins of this world to choke us out, to stifle the life that God began, I believe that if we will really repent and turn to God it's not too late we can see this thing turned around we can see another great awakening 
we can see a great revival. And if it doesn't happen all of America, I believe it can happen here. But I believe if God's people will pray, we can not just see it in our homes, in our family, but in our community and throughout this land. As we close this morning, you know, oftentimes we come and we repent of our own sins. We need to do that. Any sin that's in our heart, we need to repent of it and make it right with God. But as we come to our time of prayer this morning, I want to ask us not to just repent of our own sins, but let's repent on behalf of this church. Repent of the sins that we've had. We knew to do good and did it not. It's repent of our prayerlessness. It's repent of our apathy. Let's repent that our hearts have been cold. And that we've sang lullabies and slept as the enemy has wreaked havoc. Let's repent of the sins of the church. Because if judgment is to come, it will first come in the house of God. Let us allow God to judge us. That we would repent and turn our hearts back to heaven. So that God could move and work in us again. I'm going to ask us all to find a place to pray. Pray at your seat or come gather around the front. But let's use this as a time for us to repent for our own sins and for the sins of the church.